Hello, my name is Greg Madison, and this is The Living Process, a series of podcasts and videos that are mostly about focusing and the work of Eugene Gendlin, an existential philosopher and psychologist. This episode is actually a special edition for New Year's Day 2024. It marks the end of the first season of the series of seven conversations I had with different focusing people. And the next series, we'll start with Kevin McEvenu in a week's time. This current episode is a conversation between Ernesto Spinelli and myself that we had when the first lockdown happened in the UK during COVID. We followed it up a year later with a second conversation. And this is uh, an edited version of both of those conversations together. It runs for about 90 minutes. And I thought it was so interesting to go back to the experience of COVID and being locked down, isolated in our homes, at least in the UK, that's what happened. And how at the time it seemed like something fundamental was changing in human existence and in our societies and the way that we organized ourselves and understood ourselves and what we thought was possible and not possible and what our governments um, were telling us to do and not to do and how we all responded to that in perhaps very different ways. It was such a time of turmoil and a lot of grief and horrible things happened. And while it was all going on, it seemed like nothing would ever be the same again. And yet here at the beginning of 2024, it's almost as though the world is determined to forget all of that and to march ahead into the brave new future that already has its own issues of polarization and division and threats to democracy and wars in the world and all sorts of things happening. But have we remembered anything from that COVID experience? Is it actually all behind us and forgotten and buried, so to speak? So in this conversation, you can see where we're right in the middle of it. And we're talking about the experience in a way that when I watched those conversations again, I was really shocked at how vividly it came back to me, how much I had forgotten about the things that I personally had gone through and the state of the world at that time. But also, I think the most heartbreaking part of it for me was the idea that something fresh and positive and optimistic might come out of this whole horrible uh, shock to human society. And I guess just feeling like as we forget the experience, we also are losing touch with the possibilities that might have come out of such a strange, shocking event. And I wanted to re-release this edited version of those two conversations that are about a year apart, just to see if anyone else is interested in remembering what it was really like. And perhaps like me, you also had some kind of hope for what we would return to, that it would be a, a new world in some way and something wonderful might come from all of the uh, loss that people experienced. So as I say, it's a special edition and uh, Professor Spinelli is not that well known in the focusing world, but he's one of the best known existential psychologists in the world today. And uh, he has very interesting insights, not only into COVID, but into many things. I may follow this up with another 
much shorter, probably 30 minute episode where we talk specifically about how the, the pandemic changed psychotherapy. So if there's interest in that, maybe leave it in the comments and I'll work on it. So here it is, uh, an unusual episode for the living process, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm, I'm curious to see what you make of it. I think what I find myself going through at different points uh, over the last few weeks that I've been in kind of lockdown and going out occasionally, very occasionally. I mean, going out, I'm lucky to have a garden so I can go into the garden and, and do that. But going out into the street and doing some shopping and stuff like that. What I find is that most of the time I can kind of navigate through that I guess kind of accepting it. This is the situation I'm in and I can look at it in a way that is, is intrigued by it to some extent. But I also notice that there are various times when it just suddenly hits me in a way that I feel really, I don't want to accept it and I don't like it and I get angry about it. And I also get a bit, I, I get quite scared about it. Uh, you know, um, uh, particularly when I direct it back on myself and I say, well, I'm in that group of people that keeps being highlighted as being in danger for, for age reasons or for medical reasons or whatever. And there's just something that I, I just start, I just go, this is unfair. This isn't right. This, I, I, I don't want this. And then I catch myself saying that, and I think, well, what, what are you talking about? You know, unfair, not right. You know, what, what, what is that about? Um, so I think my experiences of going out are when I, I, either the acceptance of the reality of it is really strong, and it, in a strange way, it opens me up to looking at things differently. Um, looking at things more intensely, I think, you know, kind of listening to the bird song or noticing people or the silence because there's no planes in the sky. You know, I, I, I notice these things much more powerfully than I guess I did prior to three weeks ago. And then there are these other times where I don't want to notice these things and I, don't, and I kind of want things to just be as, as I imagine they were. Um, and that sense of loss of freedom really comes over me and also that sense of fear, you know. So I start to notice people around me and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they scare me. You know, I don't, I, you know, they, they could infect me in some kind of way. So that's the main thing. People have become dangerous in those yeah. moments. Yeah, that's one of my clients spoke about, like, little kids being weaponized. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it sounds almost like you're, and, and I, I resonate with what you've said in my own way, but that there's um, one level where there's almost like a, you can choose a response. You can choose to be open to it, to be curious, to be interested, even yeah. to be exhilarated at moments by this strange world. And then there's other times when you realize this isn't a choice. Yeah. This is something I've been thrown into and I can't just crawl out of it. I'm stuck here until yeah. it changes. Yeah. And then there's fear for me, at least sometimes and claustrophobia yeah yeah and um and it's a very odd when you talk about sort of seeing the world differently and seeing nature differently i don't know if nature is different or if i'm just seeing it differently um, a lot of people are talking about how nature is coming back and that may be true um but i was thinking about that this morning and i was thinking i, th I that seems true that the, the I think maybe it's just I'm noticing because I don't have as many distractions and I see the plants growing and I see the insects coming and I hear the birds. 
um, and the rest of the world has receded in terms of noise. But I also this morning was thinking, but that view of nature makes it sound like nature's on the outside. Nature mm. is what's out there and not me. Yeah. And it made me start to think about, but I'm also nature. I'm a part of it all. I don't kind of, in a sense, I don't belong to myself. I belong to nature and it's in me doing its thing in me as well. Yes. And if I am paying it, attention to the environmental nature in a special way, am I also called to pay attention to my own nature mm. in some kind of fresh way? And if you, I mean, if you try that, if you attempt that, what, what happens? Well, I'm noticing a couple of things with that. One is not wanting to wanting to distract myself. I mean, I'm noticing corners of my house that I have never even seen before. <laughs> just, the, 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 um, just the ingenuity of distraction is, is mind-boggling. Yes, yeah. So on the one hand, I notice I'm not wanting to, wanting to keep things as they were by just kind of holding my breath during all of this and just not really opening up yeah. to it. It's holding on to the familiar in some way. Yeah. And then there is this more un uncanny calling to myself. And I don't know what it is. Mm. I don't know what it's wanting me to open up to. And there are times that I sit down and I do purposely tap into it. And it's disconcerting yeah. for me. Yeah. And a part of it that I hadn't expected to find was grief. How so? There's, I hadn't been consciously aware of a kind of a grief, but I, a couple of days ago, I started to notice a kind of a grief in my chest. Right. Um, not for any particular person, because nobody I know has died from this or been yes. you know, yes. debilitated by it. Yeah. But grieving for almost like lost assumptions or a world I used to know and think it's yeah. never going to be the same what's broken down to some extent has been the, the, the ordinary defenses that we have to, to, to escape from, let's call it reality. Mm -hmm. you know? And I wonder if, if that sense of grief that you're feeling is precisely when you let go of whatever def ordinary defenses there are Mm -hmm. And you really are willing to confront, you know, this is how things are for me. This yeah. is how I actually experience things. You know, so, the, the, I suppose really being confronted with how we do protect ourselves through, yeah. I guess, the habitual things we do. Absolutely. You know, and for, for various reasons, the habitual things we do have been taken away from us. Uh, even if we're, you know, even if something like shopping is a habitual thing we do, mm -hmm. the way that we have to do it now is no longer part of that habitual stance. We're still doing it, but it's new and we're not used to it. And so we're not protected by it in mm -hmm. as well as we've become, become used to. Yeah, And I, I'm just thinking of it in relation to your sense of wanting your room to remain as it is, mm -hmm. whether that's part of it as well, you know, that sense of uh, this allows me to offset that, those times of grief or those times of openness. Mm -hmm. I can kind of call myself down into something that feels like it lasts over time. Um, yeah. Because, and let me just say it back to you, because uh, I wanted to respond. I think you're saying that um, in the pre-world, we had the possibility, this is my way of saying it, of almost anchoring ourselves to kind of floating above what we're really experiencing, feeling what so-called reality is yeah. actually going on. Yeah. We can easily distract ourselves and live in that. 
here. By and large. Well, underneath something's rumbling, but we had all of these different ways of not paying attention yeah. to it. Yeah. And that in this world, what has happened is not just that the world has changed, the reality has changed, but also our access to it is more unfettered. Yeah. And that that, I would say, is very unnerving. Yeah. It's not just wonderful, although it may have wonderful aspects, yeah. but it's also very unnerving because what was hidden is now being unconcealed in some yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the only thing I would say is that, that you know, I think what, what, we're, what we're also recognizing is that, that that free world that we inhabited or claimed to be in that was illusory as well. It was only free because we'd, we'd constructed various safeguards around it that made it seem as though yeah. we were in that kind of free space. Yeah. And having lost those safeguards, we're confronted with the fact that it never was and probably yeah. never will be. And, and, and so that, that intensity that people feel some of the time whether positive or negative, um, is, is when they're most in touch with that awareness that the things that they'd cocooned themselves in, in the before just weren't available to them. But equally, that desire to somehow return to that safety is also important in the, in the way that maybe we feel safe in certain rooms or... As some people have told me, you know, actually, I quite like being locked in, you know, it, it uh, I don't know if I ever want to <laughs> want to get out again, because this feels really safe. I know where I am, who I am, uh, what to do, what not to do. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so there's something about that security mm -hmm. that in some ways is as important as the awareness of its illusory aspects. Uh, you know, we keep hearing these figures of, you know, thousands of people dying here, there, and most of the time we just keep them as figures mm -hmm. until for one reason or other, either because we're touched personally by a particular death or um, uh, we have a connection to the to the space in which these these figures inhabit, uh, that it suddenly the figures stop being stop being empty, and they have an an emotional power to them, yeah. and it's terrifying. You know, it becomes really uh, not just terrifying because of the death itself, but something about more more about dying than death. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, and I think, again, that points to the sort of maybe the dichotomy between the abstract and the particular. Yeah. The numbers are just so abstract yeah. and you just see them increasing day after day. And I agree. It's like it takes something to break through that because I think that is one of the ways that we secure yeah. ourselves is to stay at the abstract and the conceptual. Yeah. For me, one of the things that breaks through it and makes me start to consider it for myself and as a, as a reality that actual human beings are suffering this yeah. is to see the bodies being carried out. Yes. And to see these wrapped bodies, that's for some reason is something I can project myself into and think, oh my God, inside that yes. white covering is a human body that a few hours ago was a living human being. Yeah. And then starting to hear, I mean, they're not only being concerned for everyone, suddenly it seems more real, but then it's also more real for me. Yeah. And thinking, hold on a second. If I start to develop a dry cough and a temperature, yes. what is my response to that going to be? I can't just assume, because now you're hearing about 20 year olds dying and people that were fit and well dying, people in their 50s, like me dying. Yeah. I can't assume I'm just going to come out of this. Yeah. And yet, in a sense, although this is an extreme situation, that was always the case. It's uncovered something that was always the case, rumbling along 
underneath all of my assumptions of the world and the order of the world. And this has just kind of ripped that open so that every once in a while, at least, I actually confront. Yes. This could be the end of me. Yes. And that was always true. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I think that sense of this could be the end of me, it, you know, in a, in a way, I, I respond to that or I, yeah, I, I, I kind of, yeah, I experience that as I'm being taken out of relation. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer part of that wider relation of things. Yeah. And, and it's that that is awful, you know, unacceptable. Um, how can this possibly be? And I think when you see these, the, you know, uh, these bodies encased in, wrapped up or whatever, um, it's almost like, I think what you might be seeing is that sense of these, are, these things are no longer part mm-hmm. of the life equation. They're, they're, uh, they've been taken out of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it. I've noticed in the, you know, in, in the news items and listening to people talking on television and so forth, how this notion of relation and all being interrelated has come more and more to the foreground. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's come, it's come into the foreground in a way that has a kind of negative quality to it or a kind of dark quality to it because it's, it's almost like they're saying it's because of relatedness that we're in this terrible situation um, because we can't escape <laughs> the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. We can't cut ourselves off in any complete sense. Therefore, re- you know, relatedness is, is kind of dangerous. Um, it has its, you know, we miss it uh, when, when we feel there's not enough of it or whatever, but we te- we've tended to only see the positive sense of relatedness. And this is bringing it very clear. Relatedness has its implications that are not always pleasant. Um, uh, they can be terrifying, not only for feeling in relatedness, but also from that sense of being ejected from it. The part of that that does resonate for me is the fact that you could be carried off as a diseased individual that needs to be isolated from the world until you're dead. Yeah. And to go through all of that, uh, actually physically isolated and separated from everyone who used to hold you in the world. Yes. You know, just the last few days, there's been this, this discourse going on about, you know, what to do with anybody over 75. You know, so 75 becomes a, a figure. It stops being persons. It's just an age. Mm-hmm. And it, 75 and over... Uh, it, it's to be looked at and treated and understood in a way very different to under 75. Yeah. You know, and, and so again, it, it's like we're only focusing on the age number and eliminating the person. And, and I think that's part of that reaction that we have. Um, Certainly that I, I think I've had at that lower level when walking down the street and looking at people and in a sense not seeing them as people anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seeing them as agents of death, you know, yeah, exactly. in a kind of way. Or, or as, as, as um, susceptible, like if I pass an older person, I give them a wide berth. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're quite old enough to get that from me. Oh, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm getting pretty close to that age group where they're going, oh, you know, you're just a number now. But another thing that adds to that, you're just a number now, is to hear how people, understandably but yeah. horrifically, are being triaged. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. If you're a certain age or have some other kind of disability exactly. or condition. Exactly. You, your palliative care is what yeah. you'll get. And again, you know, there probably is, is a kind of reality to, you know, does it make sense to put people who are in a very weak state to make them go through further agony of being put on mm -hmm. breathalyzers and so forth? But the way it's expressed isn't expressed from that humane yeah. standpoint. It's being expressed from a kind of almost some bureaucratic cutoff point that says, you know, past this point you're no longer in the relation you know yeah. you're you're outside of it you, you're just you're just something rather than a person yeah exactly as though it's a clinical decision and yeah. and made very clinically and why do you think that is that that is such a strong response is the dehumanizing rather than the kind of the deepening of, of a human well, I, th I think part of it is what we've been talking about, that if I, if I do that, mm -hmm. then I create a kind of safety, a kind of security. You know, the, first of all, in terms of identification, that I am not them, I am not these numbers, I am in the, I am in the safe group, uh, I am in the human category as opposed to dehumanized category. And secondly, I think it, it you know, it's, um, it, it puts the onus of what happens on these other beings, not on me. It, it, it takes a certain responsibility out of my hands. It's not, it's not got anything to do with me. It's got to do with what, these pe these ex people are and what they do and what they did and didn't do and all of that stuff. And I think in a strange way, it, it creates um, the, at least again, the illusion of a, a, a kind of identifiable cocoon. Yeah. Why is the response to close down rather than to open up yeah. to what's actually occurring? And it makes me, wonder if one of the lasting or maybe longer term consequences of this strange period of time once it evolves into something else whatever yeah. that is yeah um is that we have not because we chose to but because we were thrown into it we've we've had this kind of some of those cocooning assumptions ripped open and we're at least in this kind of a uh, dual world where, yeah. and it reminds me of um, Heidegger's The Unheimlich, where the unheimlich or the uncanny, where we're in a familiar world that is not familiar. Exactly. Where we're, we're in something that was supposed to remain hidden enough that we could feel at home yeah. has been exposed. And we live in this uneasy um, openness yeah. to both the wanting to be cocooned, the wanting to retreat, and that something has come like right in our faces so um, starkly yeah. that that neither works anymore. We can't simply open up. It's for some reason. Yes. It's too makes us too vulnerable, yeah. or too unstable, or too insecure, yeah. and yet we can't any longer fully retreat. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I, I don't, my own sense is, is that, uh, that that tension between, you know, the wanting the openness and wanting the, illu the whatever, the security is, is inescapable. You know, we, we want both. And in a sense, we require both, I think. If we only stayed with the openness, I, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how we would, how or if we would survive in, in a kind of social order fashion. It, I mean, I think it's very interesting. It, I think it depends partly what we mean by opening or openness. Yeah. Um, but also 
the one thing that I think is different is for someone who has gone mad in some way, whatever that means, yeah. that I think often or almost always is a, an individual experience. And part of the madness is the difference between that individual and everyone else. And I think in this situation, one of the things that is so unique is we've all been thrown in at the same time. Yeah. And maybe that is a qualitative difference that what happens next might be different than just the unbearable openness yeah. that often happens to the individual that maybe as a shared, it's happening to everyone I think if people are reminded of that, because I think the tendency is to forget that. Yes. Yeah. And to individualize it. If people are constantly reminded, hey, this is, your whole life has collapsed. Your whole business that you've worked towards for 20 years is gone. Yeah. Um, your wonderful lifestyle is now totally unstable. Yeah. But it's the same for your neighbor. Yeah. It's the same for everyone else that you know everyone to some extent even you know some of the clients i work with financially are secure yes but only financially and even in that way they also think yeah. what is secure is a bank secure is like what what is secure anymore yeah. and the fact that everyone's been thrown into it maybe that does raise a very unique kind of possibility yeah I think that I agree with you that it raises a possibility. Yeah. My my sense, however, is is that the likelihood is is precisely that kind of mass forgetting, mm -hmm. um, or maybe not even not necessarily forgetting, but more a, a kind of mass reinterpretation of things. Uh, so we look at it as well. This is. This happened because X, you know, whatever X may be, yeah. uh, we didn't have, we didn't know enough, or we didn't have the right tools, or we, you know, th there's some kind of explanation that becomes possible and acceptable and desirable. Um, not for everybody. I agree with you. I think I think there's going to be. Uh, always a proportion of people who look at this and go, this has really highlighted something important to me. I, you know, I can't go on, maybe I can't go on living and under the assumptions that I've lived under for X number of years, or maybe I don't want to go on living under those assumptions, yeah. or it's, it's liberated me in some kind of way, or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all those possibilities. And, I think we're picking that up in our, our work with clients as well. You know, uh, I've had several clients say to me, you know, I hate to admit this, but actually the onset of the virus, I, I, I've, I've never felt so in touch with myself as I do now. Um, and I've realized that so much of my life was spent in terms of things like planning for the future or looking at things in, in a certain way or having a kind of diary or calendar that said, this is what I'm doing today and tomorrow and the next day and so forth. And because of the threat of the virus to all of those things, I've put all those things away. I, I, they don't make any sense to me anymore. And I'm, I'm living a much more in that sense, chaotic life, in the sense that I'm open to whatever opens itself in front of me. And I feel great, and I feel awful for feeling great because, uh, uh, because it, it, it's a greatness that's come as a result of this awful situation. Yeah. But it's, it's genuine, you know, they're not, yeah. I don't think they're lying to themselves or to me when they express this. Yeah. Um, it's awful because again, we have to really work, I think, to remind ourselves yeah. people are dying. Yeah. Um, but I think that's really interesting. It, that some, for some people, this is, this is a retreat. Yes. 
and through this is a, like a kind of post-corona growth yeah. that might happen, you know, like post-traumatic growth. And also all of this talk of this is a shared trauma, blah, blah. Yeah. Real bullshit. Yeah. For some people, this is not a trauma, partly because they haven't even opened up to the reality yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. And for other people, it, as you say, something is emerging that is interesting to them yeah. and welcome and yeah. feels almost like this is a, this is a very strange way to receive a gift. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can they, can they maintain it? But can we maintain it is, yeah. is the issue, you know, and yeah. what, what would help us to maintain it? I guess it's going back to that sense of stay with the reality of things, you know, stay with what's there for you rather than what you feel ought to be there or once was there uh, or might one day be there again, but just stay with what presents itself. For me, I, I totally agree with that. And I, <clears throat> For me, that's the, pro the practice of focusing. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. It does not have to be focusing. But where, where the intention is to stay with actual moment-to-moment -moment experiencing yeah. and to be open to what that, how that might inform you. Yeah. Because um, I notice in myself, even though I know focusing, <clears throat> I also have this part of myself that insists on projecting me into the future and a future that looks like the world I knew. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it just insists on, on holding that line, holding yes. on to that yes. line, even yeah. though I yeah. know how to drop down into my experiencing and my, yeah. my actual current experiencing is very different than that. And, and that's the thing again, it's like, you know, that insistence, um, you know, there's an implication in what you're saying that almost, uh, that is almost about, I wish I could get rid of it. Um, no, I, I, almost the opposite. I wish it would come true quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's, okay. my, that's my identifying that's, with Okay, I, I, but it would change somehow. It would either take over... And, and I guess what I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to point to is that, you know, there's the tension again. You know, there's the tension between, on one hand, you know, these, th this, this sense of what happens to me when I, when I focus on what, what is my current lived experience. Yeah. And then when, nonetheless... I have these, this insistent position of looking into an imagined future. Yeah. Um, and I think if we could accept that, that we, we, are, we are going to be in that tension, that yeah. it's not one or the other, it, yeah. that, that what, in a sense, what moves us is both. Well, for me, I, um, what I find interesting is trying to take a step back from both and trying to open up to both and kind of be curious about both. Yeah. The problem for me is when I identify with one and try to hold on to that as the picture of what's going to happen and what I most deeply want yeah i don't want to take sides i want to be able to step back and just be yeah. curious about both yeah because i can, as soon as i do that even imagining doing that i can yeah. i can imagine other possibilities that have a little of each in them exactly yeah exactly yeah and you know i mean if we're going to talk about things existentially in any kind of way for me that's that's the great contribution of existential thought that it, it it's not I think a, I think a lot of people understand it as it directs us to a certain way of living or being or whatever yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't see it in that way at all. I, I see it as all it's saying to us is, you know, uh, stay with the way of being that, that you've adopted. Own it. Embrace it. Uh, challenge it. Be curious about it. Uh, engage with it. Um, it's not about this is the right way to be and this is the wrong way to be. It's, it's trying to break away from that. Yeah. And, and, and really adopt a position that's, that's about ownership of one's experience. Yeah. And I think the paradox is, is that the ownership of the experience actually allows you to do something with it, to mm-hmm. reconfigure it in some way, to find some movement within it that you couldn't see when you were more a victim to it. Yeah, I agree. I think that stepping back, for me, it's, it is a phenomenological attitude yeah. where you actually want to look at and explore more deeply, both from, in my case, these yeah. two different ways of being yeah. and what is in them. Because yeah. as soon as I do that, I realize that the one that yeah. you know, was pulling me to the future that is familiar yeah. Yeah. And it's almost like that's the one that just wants to press play. It's yes. like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm yes. sick of pause, just press play, but, you know, just get back to that. I, I, I know that this is an opportunity for me to not just get back to that. Yeah. Um, but I also know there's something about getting back to that. There's something about that way of being that provided a stability, um, <clears throat> a foundation. Yes. That also allowed all sorts of other possibilities. Yeah. It wasn't all bad by any means. Yeah. yeah. That sense of foundation is not something to be minimized, you know, yeah. and I think, yeah. I think uh, all those evasive things that we might look at and be critical of about the way people are or respond to things or whatever, at the core of them is, is that desire for a foundation, I think. And, uh, um, and it's that we've, you know, we've, we've assumed that foundations are dependent upon certain ways of being. Yeah. And challenges like what we're facing through the virus are, you know, confronting us with, well, maybe what happens when your assumptions are wrong, that those foundations don't hold? Does that mean there's no foundation? Or does that mean that there are as yet un- unnoticed foundations? Yeah. I think I think what happens is, for me at least, is, and I would make a claim it's not just for me, but I don't know, Um, is that when those, I would say, misplaced foundations in the external routines and holding all of these distractions in place, when that starts to break down, I do discover a different kind of foundation that's much more in my own experiencing process it doesn't give me the same stability and predictability, but it, it doesn't leave me groundless. Yeah. What do you think? Now, this is only, I think, the second week of being locked in our houses. Third for me. Third for you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think second for me. So you're, you're in the future with this. Um, I think it's a process. I think initially it was very odd and strange and people maybe rebelled and didn't comply so much. Then it moved on to actually something positive might come out of this. And I suspect it'll move on to something else and to something else. And it's going to be a whole process of different kind of moods as we persist in this kind of situation. So given it's your third week, what at the moment what is your best guess of what lasting shift in human society might come from this? That's really difficult because um, my, my sense is that the tendency will be very great to 
diminish mm -hmm. the power of the experience that we've had and to claim that we we return to the normality that we experienced before. So in, in, in a very broad sense, I, I, I don't have a great deal of, um, I suppose, hope in, in the sense of what, what this may change for us. Um, in a broad sense, I do think that uh, nonetheless, a substantial number of people, maybe not all of us, but a substantial number of people, and I'm not suggesting that I would be one of them, I have no idea, but I think that, uh, that some number of people will not allow themselves to pretend that the, the world has just gone back to the way it was and so forth. And so I think that um, in that sense, there will, I, I suspect there'll be possibly quite a, a flowering of creativity. I think perhaps initially in the arts, uh, in our ways of thinking, um, at a more everyday level, I suspect that it will change the way we understand uh, um, the kinds of relations that we have, how we relate, mm -hmm. what we relate to, Maybe the way that we, undoubtedly, I think the way we work, a lot of us work will change. Uh, I think a lot of people are finding working at home something that gives them satisfaction. So in that sense, the, broadly speaking, the, the way we are with relation uh, and the way we give expression to relation I think those are the things to look out for. That's my guess. What's yours? <clears throat> um, I'm only in the second week, <clears throat> so it's less informed. Uh, I would say on the social level, my anticipation stroke fear stroke hope <laughs> is um, that I suspect that there will be a move to try to normalize things, yeah. a top-down move to yeah. normalize things, and it'll be met with a bottom-up move, partly to normalize things, but also partly to say, hold on a minute, so there is a magic money tree. Yeah. You found all of this money, you found ways of supporting people that you said were not possible. <clears throat> and I think that maybe there will be a move to keep alive possibilities that had previously been totally off the table. And I don't know if that's like a uh, guaranteed annual income or something. I think there will be some fundamental questions that previously were too radical and aren't anymore. Uh, but I think there'll be a struggle for those. They won't just automatically emerge yeah. on the one hand. And on the more relational and personal level, my hope for myself and also for others, but partly because it's what I want, yeah. is that this, um, that I will go back to <clears throat> what will emerge as my new work routines, because there will be some kind of routine. There already is a, a new kind of routine. Um, but I will go back to them with some uh, more, with a more inclusive sense of my being. Yeah. With those routines not leaving out so much of me as they did previously. Yeah. 
Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so it's been just over a year. I was looking at, I was looking at, I, I didn't actually look at the, uh, at the previous discussion, but I noticed it was in early April as opposed to the end of April. Yeah. And I thought about reviewing it, you know, listening to it again. Yeah. I couldn't face it, to be honest with you. Exactly the same with me. Um, and I, uh, you know, it made me wonder why not. I mean, part of it, I just don't like listening to myself and, and all of that. But um, there was just something about it that I just didn't want to hear. Yeah, me too. It's, and I, I was thinking, why? Yeah. It, for me, a part of it was like, I, I felt like I just couldn't bear to go backwards, <laughs> back a year and uh, be exposed to that again. I think there's I think there's something about that, but I it made me wonder whether in a strange way there was an optimism in it that yeah. I don't feel anymore. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, at, at different levels, you know, uh, an optimism around maybe the amount of time that we were we were going to be facing this. Mm -hmm. And maybe more importantly, the outcomes of it, you know, that, that things might change in a significant way, um, uh, maybe for the better. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I feel quite so strongly about that anymore. Um, I, I, I wish I did. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I'm feeling something very similar that at the beginning it was shocking and exciting but also partly there was the sense this was an opportunity for something fundamental yeah. to shift or to be addressed somehow yeah and like you i'm not feeling that now and when i was thinking about I mean, when we spoke about having another conversation and we both kind of shrugged our shoulders and said, well, I don't know if I have anything to say. Yes. I thought about that too, just for the last couple of days. And um, I feel like having had a couple of days of more direct exploration of my experience, that it is feeling a little bit clearer to me. I don't feel quite as blank. Okay, good. Um, I certainly don't feel like I did a year ago. Yeah. But that I, I was curious why the blank? Why it's almost like I'm looking through a frosted window or something. I can't really, everything's opaque. And I wondered about that. And I feel like there's just a very strong tension between a desire to go back to something familiar and something secure and feeling like there's a clear end to this. It's like, you know, Wednesday, it'll all be over. Thursday, everything will be back to normal. On the one hand, wanting that. And on the other hand, feeling like something has changed and I'm never gonna be convinced by that again. And even the, 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 the little forays I've made into town to go back into shops that are open now, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel the same. You know, I quickly go into a shop, I quickly leave. I don't wanna go into town. It's not exciting. It's not, I don't like being around people like I used to. Something has fundamentally changed and it's not uh, automatically reverting to a previous experience. Yeah. I mean, do you think that that's a temporary effect? You know, I mean, it, it, let's not underestimate, you know, we've had over a year, we've had, for me, I guess it's been closer to about 15 months now uh, of, in a sense, kind of real serious lockdown. Yeah. Um, avoidance of people, inability to 
engage with them, all kinds of things that you've been talking about. And that's a long time. I mean, you know, it, it's a prison sentence. Yeah. Um, and just like I, I imagine a prisoner coming out of prison, I would imagine at first there's almost that sense of I, I just want to stay in my prison because I, I have a sense of that. I, I know what it is. I may not like it, but I know what it is. Mm -hmm. as opposed to all the unknown possibilities yeah. of stepping out. But maybe that's just temporary. Yeah, I've wondered about that as well. And I, um, on the one hand, maybe it would be nice if it was temporary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe it would be nice if we could go back to something and authentically or in a real way, kind of live in some semblance of what we used to know as life. Yes. yes. But I also wonder if it isn't almost a kind of a betrayal not to learn something Absolutely. really profound about ourselves and about our societies through this whole strange, um, yeah. almost trial of the human species it's like let's see what happens if we lock them down and start killing some of them um i feel like the, the kinds of things that are being said now about the psychological impact of this pandemic are the predictable kind of mental health stuff yeah. and it's all within a very predictable story of you know mental health responses and psychological responses to anxiety, depression, blah, blah, blah. And it's just all neatly packaged. And I do think that in some way, something else has also happened, that we have had to face the humiliation of our species. Yeah. That as human beings, we're not as special as we thought we were. Uh, we are contingent upon nature's... Uh, ability to wipe us away yeah. potentially and just the the profound uh uncertainty and lack of control and the insight that that potentially gives us i mean could we not live in a way that has a little bit more openness to all of that the, that aspect of human being mm -hmm. which has always been there but has been very easily covered over by the way we live can we not bring back at least some uh, aspect of that deeper openness to, yeah, uncertainty, not knowing, yeah, um, the anxiety of that, and to not cover it over again? Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I mean, in some ways, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a counter push to all of that through the governments, the media, the messaging that we receive all the time, which is about security, which yeah. is about protection, uh, which is about, you know, avoid this, don't do that, stay here, wash your hand, you know, all those, all those things that add to the fear of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the fear of uncertainty, the fear of yeah. openness. And I guess in some ways, you know, some of the, as much as I'm, you know, I have very little uh, sympathy for them. Uh, I think some of the recent rebellious reactions to all that um, are perhaps a kind of explosive re expressions of what you're talking about you know they're they're almost like that uh, uh you know that 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 underground reaction mm -hmm. to too much security too much protection mm -hmm. too much containment mm -hmm. um and because there's no i suppose there's no acceptance of them they express themselves in a very very harsh and you know uh, violent way 
Yeah, I think that's, I think that's quite possible. The only thing I'm thinking is I don't imagine that those particular crowds are saying, um, let's let go of the control and see what the world could possibly yeah. be. I think they're yeah. saying, let's let go of the control so that we have it the way we used to yeah. have it. No, I agree with you. I, I think it's just some kind of reaction, uh, a kind of, you know, maybe misguided, but certainly um, kind of unconsidered reaction. It's a kind of gut level, yeah. I don't want this. Yeah. Uh, and if you ask me why I don't want it, I, you know, I might not be able to tell you. I just know I don't want it. Yeah, just a real gut yeah. level frustration or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, when when societies have no means to give expression to um, to the more open, to the more explosive, mm -hmm. then it moves underground. It moves in an into an uncontrolled territory, and because of that, then it it usually expresses itself in um, in damaging or violent or aggressive yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, and and the, the more enlightened societies actually have, you know, find ways of allowing expression of this. Yeah. To sublimate it and channel it through artistic expression and yeah, through any group activities yeah. Yeah. Or, or through rituals, you know, so, you know, when I thought about what are we going to talk about? Is there anything we're going to talk about and so forth? The only thing that I could come up with was how, uh, you know, how my experiences are very contradictory at the moment. Um, so that, um, you know, on one hand, it felt appropriate to have a second discussion. And at the same time, I could feel my, my sense of I don't really want to do that. I don't know if I want to do this. What have I got to say anyway? I haven't got anything to say and so forth. And when I thought about that more, what came to my mind is that the strange thing about this, for me, about this past period of time is that I've actually had much more regular contact with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we, uh, I meet with a group of friends every Sunday on online um, on, on a weekly basis, and we, you know, we just talk and exchange what's happening and so forth. Mm -hmm. And these are long-term friends; they're really close friends. But prior to the to the lockdown, you know, we might have met every. You know, at most, maybe once a month, maybe longer than that sometimes, you know, maybe a few times a year. Yeah. And so in one sense, since the lockdown, we've had much more of a social interaction, a meeting, and we've never been lost for time, for words or things to say. It's been really flowing and natural and really something to look forward to as well. Hmm. But at the same time, I really miss them. You know, even though I'm seeing them, mm -hmm. uh, I miss them in a way that I didn't feel I miss them when I saw them less regularly. Yeah. And the missing is the physical aspect, yeah. of it, I think, that, you know, I can only see them and I can only see a part of them, but I can't. I can't get close to any other sensory experience mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's something and, about the, the just the little movements that a person makes standing in the yeah. kitchen and yeah. And just and just I suppose it's being able to be near them, mm -hmm. to you know, to grasp them, to mm -hmm. To smell them, you know, mm -hmm. to uh, you know, to just all those things that mm -hmm. um, that really make the connection so much. I don't know if it's stronger, but certainly I think it is stronger, actually, mm -hmm. um, and certainly different.
Yeah, it's like it infiltrates deeper down, a few yeah. more layers down, the molecules inside yeah. are touched. Yeah. 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 So it's this strange thing. So that at the end of our sessions, our weekly sessions, I always have this feeling of, oh, it's been great. It's been great to see them, and I wish I could see them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 both those things at the same time. Yeah, it's really and, and I suppose at a at a more everyday level, I notice that if I'm going outside to do some shopping or whatever, and somebody walks by me or I walk by somebody and the space between us is less than I'm used to or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this immediate kind of stepping mm -hmm. back reaction, yeah, um, which is usually paralleled by the other person as well. So it's almost like we both find ourselves stepping back. And then there's this other reaction that comes with it, which is this kind of almost apologetic smile that we give each other, almost like, I didn't really mean that, you know, mm -hmm. and I really would like to, yeah. to be able to be next to you, but I can't, you know, and then we don't take it on. personally. Yeah, don't take it personally. Yeah. And it's that contradiction again, you know, on one hand, don't get near me. But on the other hand, uh, I'm really sorry that you, mm -hmm. that I won't let you do that. Or, and you won't let me do that. That's interesting. I, I have a different experience. Uh -huh. One is, I mean, one of the interesting things from what you've said is that the collapse in geographical distance. Yeah. It's like probably when you met your friends once or twice a year, you wouldn't have thought, hey, let's meet all meet online. Absolutely. Wouldn't have even it thought of it. Never occurred to us. No, exactly. Same with me. Um, but I notice with my online work that I really don't want to be online meeting friends or family, you know, all my family's in Canada. And I just, you know, I, when I actually do do it, I do enjoy it, but yeah. I avoid it. Yeah. And I avoid it in preference for going down to the dog park. <laughs> <laughs> with my young dog and that's become my social life twice a day these people who were complete strangers you know a few months ago are now my contact and it's it's interesting to me um that they they are the people that i'm in physical contact with we have something in common we probably have more than just dogs in common we're getting to know each other these are people I probably wouldn't have gotten to know without a dog. Um, but just in the strange circumstances, they're my little oasis of human contact. And I, I think I underestimate how important that's been to me. Mm. Mm. Really important to me. And on the other hand, passing people on the street down here in Brighton, um, people aren't generally giving each other space anymore. It's, it really feels that people have leapt ahead to this is all over now, the, the lockdown's easing, we've had one vaccination maybe, and I'm not ready for that. And the joggers that jog right past me, exhaling deeply, it's like, I'm like, oh, whoa, you know, why aren't you keeping to the, the proper distance? And what, what it makes me think is at the beginning, there was more of a collective response. You know, when I would go out for my, my one day, one hour a day walk, then people would walk way out into the road to give each other distance. And there weren't hardly any cars around anyway. And now it feels like with the beginning of loosening of rules, the people have kind of collapsed back into their individual mm -hmm. uh, interpretation of what it means. Yeah. And it's almost like you go out now and it's a little bit of sort of every person for themselves. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think you're I think that's that's an important difference. Certainly that sense of this strange sense of, well, we're all in this mm -hmm. in the in the first phase yeah. of of the of the lockdown. 
And even with the, you know, the, the, the stupid things like, you know, clapping for the NHS and all of that, which, you know, became something, you know, organized and so forth. But initially, when it, when when that began, it was much more a spontaneous thing. Yeah. Not yeah. so much in this country, but in other countries. I, I remember watching in uh, Italians, mm -hmm. uh, you know, spontaneously going out their window and clapping or yeah. for each other uh, mm -hmm. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that then got taken up in other countries and, and so forth. But that sense of going out, you know, stepping outside your door, seeing other people stepping outside their door, uh, you know, uh, feeling a sense of real, I guess, connection in some yeah. strange way. And I think you're right. I think nowadays um, that that has, dis at the very least, dissipated. Um, I don't feel a connection to these other people walking down the street or where they're just other people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, who have their own lives and their own experiences and... Uh, and who, like you, I experience as still being largely potentially dangerous to me. Yeah, exactly. And um, with the NHS clapping and every country probably had their version of that, I found that tremendously moving. Yeah. I found it very emotional. Yeah. I don't, I've, I still don't understand exactly why. Mm. But there's nothing like that now. No, no. No, there isn't. And I think in some ways there isn't because we've, maybe because of the manipulative aspects of it, we've become, I've become for sure, much more cynical of it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I, I'm guarded. I, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is Boris at it again, you know, trying to, trying to whip up a sense of something. And uh, in a way, it, it makes me think, I wonder, I wonder if something similar like this happened in this country during the Second World War, where, you know, uh, there was a, an attempt to manipulate a, a sense of connection and comradeness and, and all of those, all of those things. And some of it undoubtedly was there. But some of it also, I gather, people just didn't just didn't fall for it. I think that's interesting. Uh, I think the initial <clears throat> standing outside and clapping, there, there wasn't any cynicism then. Exactly. It's like it, it was a pure expression of yeah. appreciation and care or something. Yeah. yeah. And recently there was one night when you were supposed to go out, either put a candle in your window or go outside that's and right. clap yes, for people right. who had died. That's and right. when I heard that, I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering what is the role of that, at least in the UK, of that kind of cynicism? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of something I was talking to the people in the dog park. <laughs> and yeah. it reminds me of something uh, that came to me as one person was talking and I thought there's something about there's a guardedness coming back because perhaps we've all experienced something that actually has been quite personal and quite profound yeah. and to actually talk about it to remain open to it it introduces a level of intimacy that is very uncomfortable yeah. and it makes me wonder why like on the BBC or wherever in mainstream news, aren't we asking publicly, what effect has the lockdown had on you? How has the pandemic changed you? And inviting people to actually talk about their experience. And I think it's partly because it's intimate. Yeah. 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 And it's intimate. It's it's individual experiences, but in a way they also tap into a kind of universal perspective. Absolutely. You know, so somebody, uh, yeah, yeah. 
But I've noticed while we've been talking that we're talking in a way almost in a kind of past tense. It's like it's we've you know it's gone, mm -hmm. and of course you know in most of the world at the moment it's it's nowhere near that. Yeah. If anything, uh, in some ways the the virus is spreading at a much more rapid rate, at a much more dangerous rate. Yeah. And I guess there's that awful sense of can we face yet another? You know, how, how, what's my reaction to the thought of... Yeah. And, and for me, there's that contradiction again, because in a strange way, I go, oh God, no, please, no, not another. And at the same time, I go, but I know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what I know what life is like <laughs> under the conditions of another. Yeah. And so I can get on with it. It's no problem, you know, I can find things to do. I can get on with my life. In a strange way, the possibility of a of yet another wave of the virus provokes a sort of security. Exactly. Going back to your point about, you know, stepping outside and the insecurity of that. It's almost like after a year, this kind of way of being is the norm. Exactly. It's the new normal. Yeah. And I, I've been like watching the news, like everyone, I'm sure, and seeing the, the horrible impact of the virus in India at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And the likelihood that variants will arise and they won't stay in India, they'll end up here. And one person in the uh, dog park <laughs> this morning, <laughs> That's the source of all of my insight these days. Um, was saying that he thought there was going to be another lockdown in the autumn, yeah. September, October, at least by November. Yeah. And when I heard that, I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. And oh, when I heard that, I thought, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> thought, oh, thank God. <laughs> there was a part of me that thought, oh, yeah, that's reassuring. And another part of me that thought, oh, no, I don't yeah. think I can stand that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if I can go back to what you were saying, you know, you, you and your dog park life yes. um, and your, your sense of what, what I heard you say was that, you know, um, talking to people in the dog park is preferable than say talking with family or friends online is that right i hesitate to say that i it, it certainly i would i seek that physical interaction with people much more than i would seek uh, the online conversation once i'm in the conversation it's different. I do enjoy it. And it does seem more real than I anticipated it would okay. feel. Okay. Um, but I certainly would, if, if you said to me, hey, Greg, do you want to go down to the park or do you want to have yeah. an hour online with your family? I'd say, oh, yeah, let, let's go outside. Definitely. Right. And OK, so my, my guess would be if you whatever the limitations of the online discussion yeah. with your family say that there would there would be a, a depth or a quality to that discussion an intimacy to it that is less likely to happen in the dog park discussions the dog park discussions would be more i don't know uh general social uh, talking about the news or talking about events, you know, not yeah. not having that depth to them that you might have with your family or your friends. Well, that's interesting because my first response when you say that is I would separate out, although I don't believe fully in this separation, but I would separate out the content and the process. Okay. The content of my conversation with my family would certainly look and sound more intimate 
compared to the, the park conversation. Right. But the feeling of it, you know, the yeah. park conversation, even if we're talking about the silly thing my dog is doing, yeah. it feels like a more profound, intimate yeah. connection yeah. with another living, breathing human being that's stumbling yeah. around in the dirt like I am. Yeah. Yeah. I can I I can connect to that, and I think it it connects to that sense I have of the conversations, the you know the weekly conversations with friends online, and that sense of oh I really valued this and been with you, and at the same time God oh, I wish I could see I I, I miss you in yeah, a way exactly exactly yeah how would and how would you say that the pandemic and the lockdown has affected you? Has, has it changed you in any way? Yeah. Um, at, a, at, a, at an everyday level, what I've noticed is that um, even though I've been managing to do focused work and so forth, you know, writing and doing things and speaking to people and so forth. Um, as an overall sense of myself, um, uh, I feel much, much less focused, you know, mm -hmm. my, my experience of existing mm -hmm. uh, has become uh, not quite so I don't know. It's fuzzy. I, maybe that's the word. It, there's a fuzziness to my experience. Part of that is a, is temporal. So there's a fuzziness to my days. You know, days, partly because of the repetitiveness of them, or the limited amount of things that I can do. Uh, they they blend into each other much more. Yeah. And so um, it's like uh, it's. It's difficult to uh, categorize or to remember. Was that yesterday? Was that two weeks ago? Yeah. Now, I, part of me thinks, is this my age? And am I going, you know, is this, but I don't think so. I, I, I think it is related to, to what it's like for me to experience being under these conditions. And what that's done to me in um, in a felt sense, um, I don't want to say I've, I, I my my sense of feelings tend to be more extreme. I either I either go into a, a kind of feeling mode that is pretty flat and you know bordering on the kind of I don't know what better word to use, a kind of unfeeling feeling yeah. at one extreme. And at the other, very easily and quickly being touched by some something. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I'm walking, I might have headphones on and I'm listening, some song comes on. Mm -hmm. So one example of that was uh, in the middle of, I still remember it very strongly because I was overwhelmed with feeling. It was in the middle of February and I was just strolling and I had headphones on and I had I had music coming on randomly, so I didn't know what was gonna come on next. And suddenly uh, uh, this uh, uh, Beatles song, this George Harrison song, um, Here Comes the Sun, mm -hmm. suddenly came on. Mm -hmm. and. I, I stopped dead in my tracks and I was, I couldn't stop crying. I, mm -hmm. I was just so overwhelmed by it. Um, mm -hmm. Partly because it was, you know, it was so dark and, in all kinds of ways and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so it, I was, you know, I, I, I was aware of how powerful the feeling was, and it tends to go to those extremes. It's either really powerful, mm -hmm. overwhelming, tear-inducing mm -hmm. moments, or a kind of flatness. Mm -hmm. And 
I think that's different to how things used to be, where there was more of a kind of somewhere in the middle of those mo more of the time. Um, it's like I've lost control of them. Yeah. 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 They come on, they, they overcome you in some way. Yeah. With, yeah. you know, things that at other times might not have moved or affected me uh, anywhere near as much as, uh, 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 say, that song did or, or something like that. Do you have any insight into what it was about that song at that moment that... Uh, well, I think partly, you know, the, the, you know, the, the optimism of the song, you know, where mm -hmm. it, it's been a long, long, lonely winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, being in the middle of winter and thinking, oh, God, yes, it has. And, and, and that sense of coming out of something. Um, it also has personal connections, but mainly I think it's that sense of, you know, that, that kind of breath you breathe mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you feel you've come out of something mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. has been yeah. awful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then looking back at, at the same time thinking, but I'm not out of it. It is still winter mm -hmm. uh, in all kinds of ways. And so the song is offering me something that on one hand i can connect to and on the other hand it's 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 that missing bit again i mm -hmm. i don't have the sun coming exactly yeah but the, but there was that time on earth when someone could have written such a song yeah 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 exactly it's kind of hopeful. and uh, yeah i think it is things like you know, mu music or some, you know, some something I might watch, some film or some program or something like mm -hmm. that, that really triggers mm -hmm. very, very strong reactions. And I think they are reactions that are about uh, a, a remembrance of things, um, yeah. a sense of loss. Yeah. Um, and maybe uh what what is there is there anything around the corner that would be the equivalent of that sense of optimism or whatever you know whatever that the sun is the sun is shining mm -hmm. but that was winter and i think you know uh i still have those extreme that kind of either flat or extreme but with, you know, with the sun actually shining, okay, then something has changed as well more recently. Absolutely. What about you? I mean, strangely, I resonate with a lot of what you've said. Um, and there's also a song that I, <laughs> that I can recall that uh, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. Uh-huh which yeah. deeply moved me. Um, and I don't, I mean, some of the, certainly some of the lyrics yeah. that seem to really epitomize the um, predicament or something that we were living through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, it just was an opportunity to release some emotional reservoir that was yeah. sort of yeah. not finding its, its usual expression or something. Um, but also the flatness and the, I can be focused when I'm working, I feel quite focused. And I, I enjoy that experience because as soon as I'm done working, usually I'm not very focused. I am quite fuzzy and dispersed almost in my, my being disperses into, uh, no other project almost. Yeah because I'm avoiding projects, it's, it almost seems too sleazy to get involved in too much of the kind of psycho industry generation of things at the moment. And I, I, I think if somebody had said to me, hey, there's gonna be this strange time, you're gonna have a, a year when you have very few commitments, you can't really do much, you could just work a little bit online and that's it. I would think, oh, great, like another sabbatical. Yeah. I'll get so much done. 
and I have been so unproductive and I feel a regret about that. But that regret is based upon not being able to understand the flatness and the fuzziness. Um, but at the same time, the sun has made a huge difference. And there's times out in the fields that I feel incredibly content and optimistic. Um, so it, 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 I think like you're saying, there's, there's kind of extremes of emotional states. Um, and the optimism isn't linked to the easing of the lockdown because there are, I mean, I, you know, I could go to a pub and sit outside. I could, you know, go to a shop. I'm not rushing to do those things. I've done them a little bit, but same with the people in the dog park. You know, we, we're all, we're anticipating the, the date when such and such would be possible. Yeah. And a lot of that hasn't happened. Instead, it's been, you know, the temperatures got it a little bit warmer or really bright, crisp mornings. And yeah. suddenly just that has, it's like nature is welcoming, welcoming us back in some way or something. It's, it, there's an expansiveness about it. Let's hope that's the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows what nature has in mind for us? Absolutely. Uh, maybe that, maybe we, we've all been closer to those daimonic moments in our lives. Yeah, and maybe we will have the courage to kind of embrace with some honesty what we're actually experiencing and the exactly. mystery of it. And yeah, I think it is a test at the moment how, you know, how we the fact that we're questioning, mm -hmm. um, are we just going to go back to and pretend that this was just some kind of where we kind of almost erase everything yeah or are we actually going to meet what has happened and what is ha continues to happen in a way that is really creative and constructive and challenges us mm -hmm. you know, that we're open to the challenge of it and i think we're at that you know maybe a year ago we were pretty sure that it, that we were going to meet it as a challenge yes i'm going to go in there and maybe we're now much more uncertain as to whether we will that's not to say we won't but we're just not so clear cut anymore yeah. there's maybe it's something of that fuzziness or whatever i think you're absolutely right i think that's exactly what's happening and what i want is that we ask some of the big questions. I mean, there's big questions like, will this lead to introduction of universal basic income, things like that. Yeah. But those aren't the big questions. The big questions for me are things like, what do we want to do with this species that we are? Yeah. You know, how do we how do we want to continue this species if we do? Yeah. And what does that require? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that sense of what really matters what really matters to us exactly you know and we've it's almost like being being aware we've allowed ourselves to get caught up in things that we've told ourselves are important and really matter but actually it, it takes something like this to realize that they don't mean very much at all and that we've avoided actually exploring more deeply what what is there that that does matter to us that that really both person both individually and universally I, I would love that if that became the yeah question on everybody's lips is what really matters to us yeah yeah well maybe that's a place to stop it feels like the stopping place yeah all right okay I think it was worth it I hope so yeah. Okay. Let's, let's see. Okay. okay. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.